crammed into us due to race and culture and other, other aspects. And all of those things prevent us from finding our soulmate. So at the end of the day, we're far better off dealing with those emotions. But you will in time be told who your soulmate is. In the spirit world, there are groups of people in the spirit world who all they do is find your soulmate for you. <laughs> and you know what happens most of the time? They find their soulmate and bring their soulmate right to their doorstep. If you could think of your house back there as a doorstep, right? And you bring your soulmate right to your doorstep and you know most of the time they get rejected. Mm. Because of not dealing with emotional injuries. Now, when I say most of the time, if, if a person has brought their soulmate to the first, second, third spheres of the spirit world, oftentimes they'll be rejected. By the time you get to the fourth or fifth sphere, you can imagine you've released the majority of your causal emotional baggage regarding intergender relationships. Now, of course, you're able to feel a lot more strongly. And because you're able to feel a lot more strongly, you know, you can feel and sense that this person actually is my soulmate. And oh, I've just fell well in love just by seeing them sort of feeling. But that can only happen after you've dealt with a lot of emotional injuries. And what we'll do, myself and Mary, is we'll talk about those injuries and what, you know, how they've affected us in our relationship and so forth. And it'll be very powerful for you to see what's going on. Because so, Mary felt very strongly that I wasn't her soulmate. All right. And while I felt she was. I remember her saying she was shocked that there was no fireworks and sparkles and exactly. all, the, all the bangs that were supposed to go with it. Yeah, that's right. And see, and this is where most of us have emotional injuries. We, that's what we expect from a soulmate relationship, isn't it? But we're, we're not understanding that we're working through layers and layers and layers of intergender emotional injuries that all need to be dealt with. Yep. And once you deal with those, then you'll see your soulmate relationship grows in intensity and in desire as you deal with each emotion. If it's not a soulmate relationship, you find that growth will possibly not occur beyond a certain point. So you'll soon see whether the person you're with is your soulmate or not, based on what happens with that growth in the relationship. Anyway, let's have a break. Shall we come back about quarter two? Quarter two, four? Quarter, three quarters for now? Thanks. With this outline, I made a purposefully short one because I find I talk too much if I make a long run. Um, but you notice at the bottom of the outline, there's five or six movies that I've put on this one. Um, now, some of these movies you may have already seen, I don't know. It depends how much of a movie buff I suppose you are. Um, the reason why I've listed those movies is they all deal with relationships in some way. Some of them are quite dysfunctional and other ones are quite... Uh, and some of the ones like, uh, that I found quite dysfunctional was the giant movie. Like, it just illustrated how eventually people get to put up with each other rather than dealing with issues. And, um, but there's others like Cat on a Hot Tin Roof that um, shows you going through, people going through their emotional stuff and it was a very, very good movie actually. And um, whoever's got that uh, mobile phone, could you silence it please? Thank you. Um, other ones there, when a man loves a woman and something to talk about, talk, demonstrate some dysfunctional movies and how, uh, sorry, dysfunctional lives and how things can actually uh, happen in it, in it and then how truth starts to actually affect the relationship, being in em the real emotional truth of the relationship. So hopefully you'll enjoy some of those uh, movies. But let's look at what the next question is. Uh, my blue one isn't working too good. What does desire do? You notice what I've done here is uh, listed five groups of questions. Each question has basically three parts. So look at first group. The first group of questions is about how I feel about my partner. Do I have a burning desire to know my partner? Do I have a burning desire to give my partner my love? Do I feel that 
my partner desires my love from me. Notice, do I feel that they desire it from me? Now, when we ask that group of questions, a lot of times we get a lot of triggers because we start asking ourselves things like, well, um, when it comes to, do I have a burning desire to know my partner or am I just really in this relationship because of what I can get from my partner? You see, that's a very important question, isn't it? Like, do I have a personally a burning desire to know them? Do I personally have a burning desire to give them my love? You see, a lot of times, because of our emotional injuries in relationships, we're drawn into the relationship not because we have a burning desire to give love, but actually because we have a burning need to get love. And, and like I said in one thing I wrote one time uh, that Mary was reading out to me this morning, um, it doesn't really matter who gives me the love as long as somebody does. And often that's the case, isn't it? We actually finish up choosing people not because of their qualities or characteristics or nature, but because of what they are prepared to give us. And what we need to start doing is asking the question the opposite way around. What am I desiring to give my partner? Oftentimes when people, when I've sat down with people privately um, in just our friendly discussions, um, although they probably felt at times that they weren't so friendly, <laughs> um, what often happens is that uh, the... The uh, oh, did I start the thing? Yeah, I did. Um, what what uh, what happens generally is that we get this uh, thing happen where one partner is saying to the other partner, "You don't do this. You don't do that. You don't do this. You don't do that." And then the other partner is saying, that, "But you don't do that. And you don't do this. And you don't do that." You know. And, and what you're getting is each partner telling the other person what they do or don't do. And it's very, very hard for us, generally, to get out of that pattern. And we need to get out of that pattern if we want to love each other. To love each other means to get into this pattern of asking myself what is going on inside of myself towards my partner. Do I really have a burning desire to love my partner? Do I even have a desire for my partner? Or is it just that my partner gives me things that I need and that I feel satisfied with and, and they make me feel loved? But in reality, I actually have this underlying causal emotion inside of myself that's driving that even, even that emotion. What's really going on? So feel free to ask yourself those group, that group of questions about your partner. And do you feel that your partner desires your love? Like, some of the hardest relationships you've ever been in would be a relationship where you desperately wanted to love the other, right? So you had this burning desire to love a person, but they did not want your love, right? They did not desire your love even. In fact, they couldn't care whether you existed or not. Right? And the question to ask yourself with all of these questions is, do, is what emotion inside of myself creates this reality? So in other words, if I answer, do I have a burning desire to get to know my partner? And my real answer inside of myself is, mm, I don't know. Like, I don't know if I really do have a strong desire to really know how my partner feels. Ask yourself, how often do I ask them how they're feeling? And how often do you listen to the answer about how they're feeling? Because if you don't often ask them often how they're feeling, then do you really want to know them? And how many, how many of us at times feel very, very strongly that we really don't want to know how they're feeling? Because they're going to say something about me that I don't want to hear or about my life or about what I do that I don't want to hear. So I don't want to know what they're feeling. And then if you allow yourself to get to the underlying emotion of that, that just opens a great deal of emotional work that we can do for ourselves if we're brave enough to keep on asking those things. So I often ask myself, how does Mary feel about me? And uh, I often ask myself, 
does she want my love? Because there are times when Mary doesn't want my love. Isn't that right, darling? And there are times when I feel like I don't want her love either. And we've got to dig a bit deeper emotionally because while I'm blocking her love or she's blocking my love, is there a relationship? Not really. At the soul level, there's not really a relationship, is there? But as soon as we unblock ourselves from the other person, now there's a relationship going on. There's a soul soul transaction going on. Over the page, you notice there's another set of questions. How do I feel about myself in relation to the partner? Do I have a burning desire to be known by my partner? I once asked my mother this question. She said to me uh, in a conversation, I'm sorry about this mum, when you see the DVD, she's now watching the DVDs. Um, uh, She once said to me in a conversation that she really, really really felt she wasn't sure whether she knew dad or not, my father or not. And I said to mum, well, you know what I think the truth is, Mum? You don't want to have Dad know you. You don't want him to know you because you're afraid of what he's going to discover. Right? How many of our, us do not even want to know ourselves, let alone our partner? Because what, what, we start digging deep emotionally and we start getting freaked out, don't we, oftentimes? Oh, I didn't know that emotion was there. What else is there? And then like, oh, there's this emotion where, and you could put in that place, there's this emotion, quotations, and put in whatever you were ashamed of. (laughs) And whatever you're ashamed of is usually what you don't want other people to know about, isn't it? And particularly you don't want your partner to know about that you just had a feeling of attraction to that man walking down the street for some reason, you don't know why, and you're a woman and you're you're with a partner, you're married and and you feel an attraction to him, you don't want, oftentimes want to have your partner know about that, do you? If you're honest with yourself, you often don't. But if you are truthful emotionally with your partner, you would tell him. But most of us don't tell him or tell her. Why? Because we're afraid of their reaction. Well, you know, that's not even the truth. You know what we're really afraid of? We're afraid of our emotional reaction to their reaction. That's what we're afraid of. We're afraid of what's going to come up inside of ourselves. If we say something, then they go down the track of a certain direction and then what am I going to do? So for example, if I say, I was just attracted to that person over there and and, and I tell my partner that, my partner might go, well, if you want to be with that person, get lost. <laughs> they might do that, mightn't they? They might just tell us to get lost and walk out the door just like that, mightn't they? And what are we afraid of? We were afraid of them doing that. And so we don't tell them. But, and this is one of the reasons why we avoid emotional truth, even if the truth is in error. Of course, if I'm with a person and I'm attracted to another person, there's an emotion inside of me that causes me to have this split attraction. And I need to face that emotion and be honest about that emotion and feel that emotion before I can release that emotion. Once I've dealt with that emotion, I'll be able to walk down the street and even be alone and still not be attracted to anyone other than the person who I'm in love with. That's what will happen automatically. So the whole, you know, this whole thing that is, you can look but not touch. You know, that, there's this whole justification that goes on nowadays for that. I don't agree with it very much at all because even the looking is generated by an emotional injury that needs to be addressed. So go into the emotional injury. So admit that it happens, but go into the emotional injury inside of yourself that causes it to happen. And it might be that you're totally not desirous of your current partner and you have never felt an attraction with them from the day you met. And it could be you're only with them because of security or some other issue or because of what they give you. And you need to be really honest and open about that and work through that emotionally. And it might mean even your partner leaving you through that process. And most of the time what we're doing is avoiding the whole group of emotions that, that are underneath that. Now remember, every single group of emotions I avoid, I'm also avoiding with God. So I'm also it's preventing my relationship with God, every one of these emotions. So I can deny it with my partner if I want, but if I'm really desirous 
and have a passionate desire for God, why would I want to choose to do that? And if I have a passionate desire for myself, if I really love myself, why would I want to do that? I wouldn't, would I? If I'm living in my soul, I will want to feel my emotions. So ask yourself those questions. Do I have a burning desire to receive love from the object of my love? That's a big issue, you know. Many of us are, have big injuries regarding receiving love. I know I, I have this injury myself. Where when somebody's treating me badly, I just sort of accept that that's the reality. But if I get treated nicely, I'm often in a state of confusion and I don't know what to do. It's uncomfortable. It's more uncomfortable for someone to treat me nicely than it is for someone to treat me badly. Right? And it comes from years and years and years of, of emotions of being treated badly at times, particularly from the memories of my first century experience, that I feel these emotions and I need to connect all those and release them. So I need to deal with all that. But there will come a time where I actually feel just as open to the emotions of love coming towards me as I do towards any, as any other emotion. But many of us have that injury where we're resisting the love of our partner. Why? Well, a lot of times we're worried about becoming dependent upon that love. And then we're worried about what happens if we, if we lose that love. What if our partner dies and I'm dependent on their love? What will happen then in my life? Can you see how there could be lots of emotions preventing me from even receiving love from my partner? And what do I feel that the object of my love desires to give me their love? So what do I feel? See, quite often what I feel is very different to what my partner feels. My partner could have a burning desire to give me their love and I might feel like they don't want to give me their love. And that's why you need to keep asking yourself, what do you feel? And when you talk about it with your partner, they can tell you that you know, I, really, I really love you and, and uh, they might be acting like they really love you but still you do not accept it. You can't accept that they actually love you. You can't actually trust that they love you and so therefore you can't allow yourself to feel that feeling coming from them. Can you see how these interplay of emotions can really affect our relationships? Then, how does my partner feel about me? How I feel my partner feels about me is the next group. Does the object of my love have a burning desire to know me? Does the object of my love have a burning desire to give their love to me? Does the object of my love, is the object of my love able to feel that I desire their love from them? Sorry about the typos. It all happened in a hurry this morning. Um, so, you know, a lot of the times we don't wear our heart on our sleeve. Well, why, why is that? It's because we're afraid of emotional vulnerability. Now, this is a very common injury in both sexes, to be afraid of emotional vulnerability. So, you know, the big tough man is afraid to show his wife that he actually loves her dearly and would be, you know, if something happened to her, he would be feeling like terrible feelings. He's afraid to show her that he, the passion of his own feelings. Do you know what I mean? Because that's a vulnerable place. What if, what if he shows her and she rejects those feelings? That would feel pretty bad, wouldn't it? So what is he avoiding? An emotion inside of himself. And so what do we need to come to do? We need to come to see that actually every time I'm preventing giving my love or I'm preventing the reception of love or I'm trying to stop someone from loving me or knowing me or feeling me, then I'm just afraid of being open and vulnerable. That's all I am. And I, there's a whole group of causal emotion in that from my childhood that I need to work the way through. So can you see that group of emotions is really, really important to work through as well. How do I feel my partner feels about themselves? Does my partner have a burning desire to be known by me? Does my partner have a burning desire to receive my love? It's pretty important questions, aren't they? Do they have a burning desire to feel my desire for them? So it's a bit like... You see this happen a lot sexually. 
where one partner has a desire sexually for the other, for the other but the other person keeps repelling that desire. Well, why would you repel a sexual desire from somebody? Well, it's interesting. The question, you need to say it to a microphone and put up your hand, Nina. It's, <laughs> it's a good question, but, but otherwise I can, nobody can hear your answer, that's all. The answer was? Because they're not coming from a place of integrity or love. Okay, very interesting. You just blamed the partner. Yeah, did you see that? So that's an emotion inside of yourself that you feel towards men. Men are just not feeling integrity when it comes to sexual matters. Can you see? Our answers often just straight away identify the emotion. So why would I... Re so, if I if, so if you had the same response as Nina, I'm repelling the guy sexually because he's not in integrity, how do you, how do you know? And if he's a person who's been in love with you 25 years, Surely he's in integrity. He loves his wife or he loves his partner. He's loved her for 25 years. Isn't that integrity? But can you see how just an emotion kicks in? Men are not capable of integrity sexually. And off that rocks and before we know we're down this track of saying the answer. Now you may be right. But the actual answers we give often immediately betray the emotions we're still holding on to. Right? So what's another reason why now everyone's afraid to answer the question. <laughs> <laughs> What's another reason why <laughs> um, the woman would be repelling the man? Graham, up the back there. Um, sorry, no, there's the man up the front's faster than you, Matt. <laughs> well, ah, uh, that's not a very nice comment, but anyway, <laughs> it's it could, because of his desire, actually. <laughs> It could be because you're feeling a neediness from the other person? The woman's feeling a neediness? Well, it could well, be the man feeling a neediness from the woman. True, yeah. But again, you've just betrayed the emotional injury within yourself. Exactly. Exactly. So the emotional injury for yourself there is that you feel that whenever somebody desires you sexually, they're going to take from you. Right? And this is where in relationships with a woman there's been this pattern that they have actually taken from you which actually reinforces this belief, but there's a causal emotion underneath that. But that is certainly one reason why I might repel the advance of somebody sexually. Any other reasons? Now, now, oh, now we're getting lots of hands. Everyone's being brave now. It's really good. Um, by rejecting, you have control. Um. That's a very good, very good statement. And you know, it's probably a more honest statement than some of the others. See, often by rejecting a person and having them want me, that means I've got total sexual control in the relationship. Now, why would I want to have total sexual control in a relationship? What, would, what emotional injuries would cause me to want that? Can you see how they might be emotional injuries of like being abused or harmed as a child? and then feeling like every single sexual interaction I have with anyone, I have to be in control. Can you see that? So can you see just by asking the one question about sexuality, for example, leads us down into these rabbit holes, if you like, of our emotions, and start, we start pulling out all sorts of emotional reasons why something might be occurring in our relationship. If you're not honest about all of these things and you don't allow yourself to do all of this discussion with your partner, and you know what happens mostly when people are having a poor sexual relationship? They don't talk about it at all, do they? Because we're afraid to. You know, I'm afraid to tell my partner actually that he's never satisfied me for the last 20 years. That's a hard truth. Like if, you start, if you've been in an untruthful sexual situation for a long period of time, and now you learn the truth of being truthful, that like, is the important thing, you're going to have to tell your partner about all the untruth that you've dumped on them for the last whatever years, right? And one of those untruths might be that I didn't find, that they, they don't turn me on. That might be one of the real feelings I have within myself that I've been hiding from them for such a long time. Can you see, obviously, when I start saying that, what that's going to do? 
Now, if my partner is open to all of their own emotions and I'm open to all of my own emotions, we'll work through that issue probably. But if one of us or both of us are not open to emotions, just that, it's, it, it, just that issue alone can cause lots of turmoil. Can you see how we've, we've built up a lot of times a castle of lies and now we're afraid to dismantle it? But the truth is that at some point in the future, every castle of lies, no matter what it is, whether it's religious, political, or sexual, or related to our partnership, will all have to be dismantled. When you get to at one moment with God, you're in a state of complete truth. So therefore, every single castle of lies will need to be dismantled. And for a lot of us, that's a lot of castles, isn't it? <laughs> So we need to have the courage to do that, to actually start pulling those things down and being honest and open. And truth is the mechanism. It's the truth that breaks down all the barriers that sets you free. Remember that all the time. The truth is going to help me the most in every single situation. So let's have a look at the last group of questions. My personal desires. Do I have a burning desire for natural love to be active in my life? Do I have a burning desire to connect to God? Do I have a burning desire to grow and change? But they are really important questions to ask yourself. Because like, let's say that both of you sit down and you start asking yourself and each other these questions. And your partner just says, look, I'm really happy with how I am. I don't have to change, you know. We have sex two or three times a week. I quite like it. Um, you know, I go out and play golf on Saturdays. You know, we go to work. I have good workmates and I've got, we've got a lovely house and good kids and, uh, you know, you make pretty good meals and everything. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, you know, we get to have a few chats every week, you know, about different things and we've got a lovely garden that we work in and, gee, things are just pretty good, I feel, you know. And you're feeling... I just want a deeper emotional connection. You know, I want, I want something deeper than this. And they're saying, no, 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 I'm pretty happy with how it is. What do you mean, deeper emotional connection? You know? Do you, do you mean we're going to have to talk more? <laughs> does, that, does, that, does that mean we're going to have to, oh, I'm going to have to watch girly chick, chick flicks or whatever? <laughs> is that what you're saying? <laughs> what are you saying, you know? And if he's feeling resistive and you're feeling like you want to progress, then obviously... You know, you'll need to work through some things emotionally. But most of us don't do that, do we? Most of us say, oh, yeah, he's right. You know, he's right. Most of it's pretty good. And I know there's a few things that I'm dissatisfied with. But all I'll do there is I'll just get a group of girlfriends to go out with and we'll have some emotional discussions. So what we do is we start filling up our life with other people who can satisfy the bits of the parts of the relationship that are not being satisfied. <coughs> can you see that? We often do that. And so we start filling up our life with external things or external people so that our relationship isn't as close as it could be. Because we know it's not as close as we could be, we feel we can't change it, we feel we can't address the issues, but we feel that it's got good parts that we don't want to give up, and so we're in this bind that we never get out of until one of us passes, generally. And then we pass into the spirit world. Imagine what you were going to feel in the spirit world if you've done that in your life. You're going to feel quite disappointed, probably, if you were that person who wanted a deep emotional connection and never had a deep emotional connection with the opposite gender, if you're a heterosexual couple, um, the opposite gender. Um, you're going to be quite disappointed with, uh, with your life, aren't you? And you'll feel the pain of that disappointment. It's far better to address the issues now, right now, in your relationship and in your life. And this is what these questions are for. The reason why I don't want to tell you about your relationships, and, and we're probably going to avoid the process, and uh, you know, myself and Mary, initially we were thinking, we'd get some of you up and talk about your relationships, you know, and then we were thinking, you know, and while I've been doing this talk, I've been thinking, mm, do we really need to do that? Because all that's going to happen is the one half of the relationship who wants things to change is going to say things, and the other half of the relationship who maybe doesn't want things to change and wants things to stay the same, 
there's going to be a conflict and then it's going to be all exposed on video of all things. It's a terrible thing for you to go through. So you don't need to do that. What we need to do instead is be really sincere about asking our own personal questions in our relationship and be, be sincere about acting upon them, what the answers are. Allow yourself to work your way through those answers. Does that make sense? Let yourself do that. All right, so those are a group of questions that are there just for your information. You can, oh, I, don't know, I was going to say, you can wipe it with your bottom if you want to, <laughs> or you can use it like it's up to you. <laughs> but Mary's all pretty upset with me saying that. But I've, <laughs> but I've said it now, so I can't think. <laughs> uh, anyway, sometimes I come out with, like, oh yeah. My sense of humour is often quite warped, so... Um, <laughs> and sometimes I embarrass myself with my own sense of humour. <laughs> Dennis, thank you. Up the back there, Matt. Oh. <laughs> Might need to give it to another person, Matt. It's no good having one, Mike. Hey, Jay. As, as you process the emotions, are your answers going to change? Yes, definitely. Yeah, the question was, is as you process your emotions, are your answers going to change? Yes, definitely. In fact, if they don't change, you haven't probably processed your emotions. So, so a lot of times we ask the question, what does love do? And then we ask the question, what does desire do, right? Those, those two primary questions, right? Do... Yeah, with a question mark. We can ask those two questions and today your answer will be totally, totally different than the answer you have. Like the next day even can be completely different. Myself and Mary in our relationship have had times where we've asked the question, do I have a desire for the other person? And I feel no desire whatsoever. And then I process an emotion and back comes my desire. Right? That will happen all the time. And as you process different emotions, the desire will grow. If you're working in a soulmate relationship in particular, what will happen is as you process an emotion, desire grows a bit, then something gets blocked, you don't feel the desire, you process the emotion, desire grows more than what it was before, and so forth. And you'll find the relationship growing and changing constantly. And if you're not prepared for that, obviously it's going to be a bit dicey uh, for you emotionally if you're not prepared for this constant change. But you're dead right, your answers will even change hourly in many cases. So you may have at one point of time feel a certain way, then release a big emotion and feel totally different. Mary's had uh, that happen with, with anger emotions towards me, haven't you, darling? Like, so there'll be one time when she's feeling all blocked up towards me, not feeling like, like she even really wants to be with me, and then process a big, big amount of anger towards men, and all of a sudden feels completely different. Just to add to that, it took me a while when we started our relationship to get used to being totally in the truth of the emotion as it's happening and to live like to really commit to the emotion right there and then and live in the truth of that and whatever the consequences of that emotion are at that moment yep. because I was tempted to do it half and half and nothing ever shifted and it wasn't because it triggered a lot of my feelings of insecurity if, if I express this emotion what will happen with the whole relationship and it took me a while to actually commit to being in the truth of what I, what I was in. Yeah, so if I say to AJ that actually I don't feel much desire for him, he's just going to say, well, let's part then. You know, so I won't say that to AJ. What I'll say instead is, <laughs> do you know what I mean? We do this a lot with our emotions, right? And so what, what we both have had to learn is to not do any of that, not base any of our truth on what we expect the other person will do about it. We've had to just stay in the truth my own truth. Even remember when it's a, from God's perspective, error-based emotion. So I have to stay in that truth. I'm angry with you. I'm afraid you will do this. I, you know, whatever it is, right at that moment, and you'll get very rapidly into the core emotions 
if you allow yourself to do that. Now what I wanted to do, so that's what desire does. So I haven't spent as much time on that because um, I want to talk more about the sexual part of the relationship for the last hour. But these are very, very important questions, desire. If you don't desire your partner or your partner does not desire you, there are very, very strong emotional reasons why. Now, often it can be an emotional reason that's to do, and, and usually is an emotional reason, that is to do with intergender issues. For example, if your partner has treated you in a way, over a period of time, in a way like they don't really care about you, anger will build and build and build and build and build if you don't deal with the causal emotion. So your partner treats you bad, anger builds. Partner treats you bad again, anger builds. And I'm, by bad, I mean saying things like ignores you. Or, you know, you've asked him to pick up the milk. He drives home, hasn't picked up the milk. You've got to go back down, pick it up. Even those little events like that, which demonstrate the care that your partner has about you. Or it could be the control your partner has. So the man might be going, no, I'm not going to pick up the milk. She's just trying to control me. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So that could be driven by another emotion. But what actually happens is the anger builds, 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 builds until boiling point, right? Until it's actually a bursting point. That's when we have our argument. We don't need to do any of that. Because we could actually say here, right here, when the first thing occurred, I could say, I'm actually angry. It's my anger because I'm covering over a deeper emotion. What's the deeper emotion I feel? Oh, I just feel like you ignored me then. So my emotion is an emotion of feeling like ignored. I feel ignored. I feel like I'm nothing. And I'd go into that, have a big cry about that. And I'd release the causal emotion. But then I would also talk to my partner and say, well, why do you treat me like that? Why do you treat me like, you know, you can ignore me? What, what do you feel about me then? And be honest about the whole thing. And then, of course, that particular anger emotion is gone. So, like, there's nothing to build on then. Does that make sense? And on top of that, we got rid of a causal emotion, which means our law of attraction will change. So there's a lot of things that can change when we just start working on it differently. But let's have a look more at the sexual relationship. The sexual relationship is created by usually one of two different things. The thing I mentioned earlier, remember I drew the soul of the male and his physical body, and there's a spirit body in there somewhere, but we'll neglect it for the moment. The soul, the physical body of the female and the soul of the female. I'm discussing here a heterosexual relationship. So this same principles apply in a homosexual relationship as a heterosexual relationship. If I have an emotion in my soul of unworthiness towards a woman. In other words, I feel in my soul, and, and by the way, a lot of men feel this way, this generation of men feel this way. See, generationally what's hap what often happens is that women have been treated badly through the generations. Now, many of the women have children. Some of those children, obviously around half on the planet, are male. And the males, depending on who they identify with, their father or their mother, if they identify with their mother, they will want to help mummy deal with her emotion. Does that make sense? There's an automatic emotion of wanting to please the woman in the male. And that comes from this deep feeling that he's responsible for mummy's pain. Mummy has a lot of masculine pain, pain towards the male gender. And this boy who grows into a man believes his whole role in life is to fix the woman's pain because of the pain of the previous generations. So this feeling of unworthiness towards the woman is very, very powerful in a lot of men. So many women have this anger still towards men. You know, the men, men did all the damage to me. Men have hurt us women generally. Men have created a lot of pain. They use their physical power to control us and to manipulate us into doing what we don't want to do. 
they keep using us sexually. Many women have been harmed sexually through abuse or through rape. Right? So there's all this rage and anger about all that that gets passed down to each woman generally. Now this man is going to, through his, if he has this deep unworthiness feelings, will attract a woman with a lot of anger towards men. Now remember earlier I talked about how there's the first and second chakras which are affected by both of those emotions a lot. And so there's a huge emotional and energetic connection now between these two people, which means there's a rush of energy through them, which of course incorporates the sexual energy. So now they're feeling passionate for each other, these two people. And they feel drawn together and they may even exist in that state for the rest of their life on earth where they're passionately involved in their relationship and passionate in a sexual relationship. But it's driven by an emotional injury. It's often our emotional injuries that create these sexual desires that we have. And one thing that I realised after, after, after a while of my own progression was that I went through this period where I connected to the fact that I just wanted to be with my soulmate and no one else. And I released a lot of emotion about sexuality in that process. And I came in the end, about five years ago, to this point where not a single woman that I could ever meet caused a sexual desire to raise in me. Now it freaked me out initially because I thought that somehow like I'd become this asexual person who, you know, is never going to experience sexual desire again. And that really distressed me. And I had a lot of emotions to work through about that, you know, just feeling like freaked out that, like, what's wrong with me? All of a sudden I haven't got a sexual desire for anyone. And I started seeing everyone also at that time quite differently, every single person around me quite differently. So I could feel the projection sexually from others, but I didn't respond to those projections. There was no response inside of me. And, I, and once I got to that place, I realised actually that the majority of sexual attraction that occurs on earth occurs through the process of emotional injury because I did not even have a sexual desire all that time. The very moment I met my soulmate, I realised that there was nothing wrong with my sexual desire. <laughs> <All right. laughs> Mary's all embarrassed. So. <laughs> what I'm trying to illustrate from that Sorry, Lana. She's getting used to me now, but anyway. <laughs> what I'm trying to illustrate by that is that the majority of the times our sexual desire for another person is driven a lot by our sexual compatible injuries. In other words, our intergender emotional injuries. And a lot of the times what we're doing is connecting to a mother figure, if I'm the man in this instance or a father figure if I'm the woman in this instance in some way. A lot of times too our sexual injuries revolve around whether we have actually disconnected from our parents emotionally or not. Do you understand what I mean by that? Let's say, let's say a, a woman who's had these really strong emotions about security all my life that come from having from my father. My father has always been protective you know, the kind of father you can run to and talk about your emotions with and all of those kind of things. And, but he's done it in a needy way in order to, because he's not got a satisfying relationship perhaps with his own wife. So what he's done, or with my mother if I'm the woman, and so what he's done is, is he's idealised his relationship with me. In other words, I've become the special woman, you know? Some of you ladies have experienced this with your fathers, right? where your fathers have treated you like you're the special girl, his special girl. And woe betide any man who ever comes into you <laughs> like, and, and wants to actually kiss you, let alone make love to you, you know, he's already a competition to this relationship. If, if you as the woman never let go of that, you will never ever connect to another man fully, sexually, for example. Does that make sense? 
because that relationship is there. So can you see how every single emotional injury that I have towards the opposite gender, which comes from, in this case, the father, in this case, the mum, is going to definitely affect my relationship. So much so for me, this is what would happen for me. If the woman wasn't almost the same height as my mother and the same build that my mother was while I was up until seven years of age, I would not even notice her as attractive. Right. And it was very interesting me working through that emotionally because I had to let go of some emotions about that. Right. So, and Mary's had the same experience, haven't you, with, with like the size of a man, had to be very much the size of dad before she would feel some attraction. Many of you, unbeknown to yourselves, probably have very similar emotions. You see, it's these intergender emotional injuries. And then it's also, how did my dad feel about himself? He's going to affect me very much as a male. And how my mother felt about herself is very much going to affect me as a female. And every one of those things will have different injuries that are stored in my soul that affect my physical body. And it's the injuries in the soul that determine how the energy flows in my physical body, which determines what, emo what emotions trigger what hormones and all of those kind of processes. And so can you see how it's all interrelated with each other? Now, if I'm basing my relationship upon sexuality, obviously se a good sex life is a very positive thing in a relationship. In fact, the relationship in its pure form will actually mirror, the sex life will mirror the relationship. So when I'm connected to the soul, if I'm connected to my soul completely, Mary's connected to her soul completely, our sex life will mirror what injuries we will still have in our souls towards the opposite gender or towards each other. Does that make sense to everyone? In this state of error that I am in, and in the state of error that Mary is in, if I am truthfully connecting with my soul at all times, my sex life with Mary will mirror what emotional injuries I have towards Mary and what emotional injuries she has towards me. Can I give an example? Yeah, you have yes, to give an example? Yes, you can give us an example. You want to give one, babe? <laughs> Um, so for me, I still have a lot of emotions about um, feeling quite afraid to be fully emotionally vulnerable with a, a wonderful man because I have feel deep feelings of shame about myself as a woman um, and I feel that a man will reject me if I bear everything that I am to the man. So that's my emotional injury. So sexually, I find it hard to be very um, vulnerable sexually, very um, passionate and forthright. Yeah. Yeah. Very sort of exposed and vulnerable sexually. Yes. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yep. Um, for me, I have a feeling sometimes that um, if I if I allow my full passion sexually, sorry, my my emotionally, that the woman will actually reject me emotionally. And so there's this, constantly what I'm trying to do is actually please the woman a lot of times rather than receive pleasure myself. So, so that's, that's also been impacted in our sexual relationship where I'm pleasing Mary, but when she wants to please me, I get a bit resistive and, and I find it a bit difficult to receive. Does that make sense? Same kind of thing. So a lot of times our, our sexual relationship and by the way, that's a good thing if you're in that state, not a bad thing, because you're in sexual truth. You're in desire truth. In other words, what's happening inside of you and what's happening in your relationship is a mirror of what's happening inside of you in all these other emotions. That's a good thing. When it becomes a not so good thing is when what's happening inside of me is totally the opposite of what I'm doing. And this is the reason why many times we have like incompatible sexual problems in a relationship is because we're not mirroring our emotions in the relationship and so therefore our sexual desire will mirror what we're shutting down. So, so the sexual relationship is a really, 
easy way, if you like, to see what's going on emotionally towards each other. And, uh, and so we've taken a lot of notice of that ourselves in, in what's going on. So if there's not much of a connection going on between myself and Mary sexually, what we do, instead of trying to address the sexual problem, because it's not actually a sexual problem, it's actually an emotional problem of something going on. And often what we do is we get to me, you know, I having some maybe anger with women that I need to work my way through, or Mary having some anger with men she needs to work her way through, or you know, those kind of emotions. And once we clear that emotionally, bang, the sexual, the sexual response is back as well. Because now there's an open emotional thing going on. You see, what happens with emotions between the two is emotions actually flow through your physical and, and spiritual bodies. Do you know when you go and lay on the table and you do a, some spiritual healing and you open up the chakras, the majority of times, the instant the chakras open up, the person on the table closes it down again, usually within 30 minutes, most of the time within a day, whatever that was done just gets undone. The reason why is because of the emotion is in the soul that actually influences the energetic response of your spirit body, which also then, so if you've got a spirit body in here as well, influences the connection your physical body has and all your hormonal response and all your physical sexual responses and everything, all affected by this. So if I get some emotion passing through me in an open way, that also opens me up sexually. Now, sometimes my emotions passing through me are passing through me because of errors. And that's why we get erroneous, like we get lustful responses for somebody who actually has a lot of other injuries. And the reason why is because as this passes through me, I can now, like when I'm projecting this out, the other person's actually receiving the emotion. And that opens them up because it's compatible with their injuries flow of energy through me and I've got this flow of energy through them, now we've also got the sexual flow happening. Does that make sense? And it's binding us together sexually but it's actually based on injuries. Now when I start dealing with my injuries and understanding this, what starts to happen is that the sexual relationship will actually mirror the injury instead of being bound by the injury. And when I say mirror the injury, if I have anger towards the woman, if the woman is in a state of love of herself, she can't receive my anger. Does that make sense? So it's not going to open her up sexually. In fact, what it's going to do is close her down sexually. And if she's got anger with men, and I'm in a state where I've worked through my unworthiness and released my, anger, released my allowance of that, in other words, I have more love of myself, when she's angry with men, and she passes that emotion to me, instead of opening me up sexually, it's actually going to close me down sexually. And it's a great way of actually working out what's going on with regard to love between the two of you. So when we did this at the beginning, it was quite interesting, wasn't it, for, for us both really. There were times, I don't know how explicit you guys want me to be, but... <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry, how explicit do you want me to be, darling? <laughs> I've got the other half, the other half myself. Um, um, just go for it. <laughs> She's going, just go for it. It's like. <laughs> what I found, this is for myself. Um, yeah, how explicit do I get? <laughs> now I'm starting to worry myself, how <laughs> But it needs to be discussed, so let's discuss it. Um, physiologically, when you're sexually excited, your body starts to secrete, um, besides secreting hormones, secretes, um, what do you call it? No, physical, like... Juices. Sure, you want to call it juices. <laughs> doesn't look like the same to me. But anyway. <laughs> anyway, so, and, and obviously your sexual response creates that ready for, ready for lovemaking, right? What I found myself is that if 
whatever emotions Mary was transmitting at me was, were compatible with my, my own love of self, then that would instantly occur. Right? And I would stay in that state for hours and hours and hours sometimes, right? in, a, in that sort of readiness state for, for making love. But as soon as she transmitted to me an emotion of, say, anger, it instantly stopped. Right? So I, and w this even happens during the sex act. So let's say we're making love and Mary has an emotion come up inside of herself of anger towards men. I instantly cannot continue, physically cannot continue. Right? And so we have to deal with the emotion. And when we deal with the emotion, then it all comes back again. And it's exactly the same for Mary too, isn't it, darling, with regard to sexual response. Yep. I won't go into the details <laughs> of yours. <laughs> so, with regard to sexual attraction, understand that the majority of times if I haven't healed my intergender emotional injuries, the sexual attraction... Oh, I, I don't agree with that, but I'll let you go. <laughs> I'm just joking. <laughs> what happens is that is if I've got these intergender emotional injuries, then what's going to happen is that my sexual response is going to be very, very dependent upon my partner having the same intergender emotional injuries in an opposite way. What, what, what I would classify as sympathetic intergender emotional injuries. So if I'm angry with women, my partner's need to, going to be in a space where she can accept anger from a man before she can accept my sexual response. Does that make sense? And so, you know, if, I, if the woman is angry with men and I'm her partner, I'm going to need to be in a space where I accept an angry woman if, if my, for, for my sexual response to be responsive. And this is why sometimes you can look at the most attractive person and when wonder why you're not attracted. Because your sexual injury is totally incompatible. Also, this is the reason why a lot of bad boys get the women. <laughs> because a lot of women have some injuries regarding, you know, being treated badly through life. And they're attracted to men who are going to treat them badly sexually attracted to men who will treat them badly. How many of you have personally experienced that? we have been sexually attracted to a man who treated you badly? Yeah, so there's quite a lot, isn't there? How many, men, how many of you men have been sexually attracted to a woman who's treated you badly? Right. How many of you men have been sexually attracted to a woman you could treat badly? So you can see how there's all sorts of things, right? Lots of you are not owning your emotions, but anyway. <laughs> It's okay to, to recognise the truth of these things. In fact, not only is it okay, it's essential. If you want to have a soulmate relationship, honestly, you will need to recognise a lot of these things in the future if you don't already. And allow yourself to actually deal with and work your way through them. Yeah? So AJ, what you're saying is, um, very often now, for all of us, our sexual... Um, desires are based around injury and when those injuries are compatible sometimes we can have a very amazingly passionate sexual union. Yep. And then you're saying as we begin to work through those injuries uh, things could get a little patchy. Yep, very patchy sometimes. Yep. But if we're both connected emotionally then whatever is being reflected in the sex act is actually a reflection of the emotions yes. that we need to deal with in our relationship. Yep. What happens when we've dealt with all of our injuries? How okay. would our sex life be? Oh, I don't want to talk about that. That's too nice. <laughs> I only talk about places I've reached. So anyway, <laughs> let's talk about that. One. <laughs> no, well, um, obviously, in the past, myself and Mary have experienced these things and have a memory of it from the first century, experiencing this, but also... Uh, so we've had a physical memory of experiencing this process as well as, obviously, feelings in the spirit world about this process. But it's a valid question, is what happens at the end of it all? Well, what will happen, actually, when you've worked through all of your emotional injuries, you also will have a constant sexual desire and longing for your partner. 
Now, for mo- when most people hear that, and particularly a lot of women that I've said that to in the past, they've gotten very upset with me because they can't conceive that they'd ever do that. But the truth is that your body and your phys- spiritual body will respond greatly to you being completely free of your own emotions. And you will find that once you reach that place, what will happen is you will have a constant sexual longing for your partner. It doesn't mean even that you'll have to have it fulfilled. In fact, you won't have a, it won't be a demanding longing. Do you understand what I mean by that? It's not going to be this kind of longing where you're demanding a response from your partner. Because love never demands any response from anyone for anything. But when your sexual desire is in totally in harmony with love and you're in a condition of one with God, you'll find that you have this constant sexual longing for your partner. And if your partner's in the same state, your sexual union will always be what they call nowadays tantric in nature, but actually it'll be even far more powerful than that. It will be a soul, you will feel a soul union sexual connection happening between yourself and your partner. So in that state, there will be no danger of one or the other of you coming away unsatisfied from the sexual act, for example. And in fact, the sexual act will continue the entire time whether you're apart or together. When you're in the soul union state, the sexual act continues 24 by 7, shall we call it. Right? And you feel the same emotions of that all the time. So you imagine you're blissed out with God, with all these beautiful emotions coming from God, and then you're blissed out with your partner. If Can you conceive of what that would be? Because that's what it's like in the 22nd sphere in your future. Matt, please. It's all right. God, I was quick. Um, <laughs> I'm so sorry about that remark before too. You, you, you just pushed, right, you just put, I didn't want to be told I'm second best. I'm <laughs> really sorry. No, I was just going to say, if you're in that state, are you going to be making a whole lot of babies? Or <laughs> well, um, the the sexual act is an act of creation. So yes, you will be creating many many things 24 by 7 in that state. So when you're in that state, your soul, which is now the amalgamation or the union of the two halves, is in this state of constant creation. That's the state God's soul is in, constant creation. And when you reach a similar state of union, although it's not nowhere near as infinitely powerful as God's, you will be in a state of constant creation. And I feel that part of that constant creation will be in the future maybe creating all these little souls who can incarnate in the same way that God has created them. And that may be one of the things ahead of you in your future. I don't know that for certain because I haven't done it yet. But it is possible that that may be the case. But even if that's not the case, you will still be in a constant state of creation. When you're in, and, and many of you realise this sometimes now already, you notice that if the, more, the more sexual union you have and the more closer condition you have, and by the way, when I talk about a sexual union, I'm not talking about physical sexual union, I'm talking about an emotional state of sexual union that you have between the two halves. The feelings that you have as a result of that inside of yourself are so empowering that that you feel drawn into creating so many things around you that you wouldn't normally have done. You see, most of the time, the majority of us in a state of neediness with love aren't we? We have these great big holes in us, like, you know, sometimes I picture it like somebody's blown a cannonball through me, you know, and there's this great big hole, you know, in my soul where love used to be and it's not there anymore and I'm just just trying to refill it up again. And so what we do in this state is we've got this great big hole and what we try to do is fill it with every relationship we enter. Now once we have actually healed it, the whole won't be there. And so we are now in a state where we can love others without them loving us. Now when we're in a state with God's love, in that state of one condition with God, what happens is God is loving us all the time and you feel it all the time. There's not a moment where you don't feel it. So there's a lot of celestial spirits with us right now. 
they are all in this state where they are constantly feeling God's love enter them and there's not a single moment where they do not feel loved. So you, you imagine that state for a moment. In that state, you don't need a single person on earth to love you. In fact, every single person on earth could hate your guts and you would still feel loved. Right? Because this love from God is just entering you and passing through you all the time. Now imagine if you add to that state another person on earth who happens to be the other half of your own soul projecting this intense love at you as well. Like Imagine that now. Now you've got not just God's love where you're in this state where it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of the world, you feel loved, but now you've got this beautiful gift coming from another person on this earth projecting this kind of love at you. You imagine how much that enhances even your already buoyant spirit and how much that places you in a place where you can create so much around you. And do you think you'd ever be worried about someone not loving you? You imagine if you could walk through life not having to worry about whether someone would love you anymore. If you, and now I know a lot of, a lot of us sometimes think, what, what, is that, what would that feel like? You know, what would that feel like? Because you think about how many of your own actions in a single day are based around trying to get love from somebody. Or trying to avoid them taking away love from you. There's so many actions in a single day that we take doing that. Most of us don't tell the truth for that very reason. Because if I tell the truth, what might happen? They might take away their love. They might yell at me. They might scream at me. What's that? That's them projecting other emotions other than love at me. And so what I'm trying to do is avoid all of that. And so I, even the reason why I don't speak the truth, my personal truth, is because I'm afraid of not being loved in the end. Imagine if that was no longer there. It wasn't a part of your feelings anymore. You imagine how confidently you would feel inside of yourself and how powerful you would feel inside of yourself. And it wouldn't matter. You could have a whole room of people yelling and screaming at you. You could even have a group of people trying to grab you and kill you. And you would still feel like it doesn't hurt. And that's what at one moment feels like, if you can picture that. And then if you can picture your soul mate in a similar state projecting all of her or his love at you. You imagine what that would feel like in that state. You've got all this love coming from God, all this love coming from your soul mate. Do you think you'd ever worry about anything else <laughs> after that point? Can you see that's also going to be the point of your highest creation? Like you can create immense things in that state because of this amazing amount of energy that just gets multiplied through love. So that's the potential of your existence. But that potential can only come about if you start separating what is the emotional injuries that you have about love from the truth about love. And that you retain the truth and every emotional injury you have in you, you experience and release and allow yourself to get rid of so that you can grow in love yourself. So if we look back now at what we've discussed over the last three or four weeks, what we've talked about firstly was God's laws, an introduction to God's laws and how they apply. Then we looked at the groups of laws applying to the issues regarding love of others. Then we've looked at the groups of laws applying to how we can love ourselves. And today we've looked at this issue of how we can now bring all that together into, a personal, into our personal relationships. Now, imagine if you could put all of that into practice in your day-to-day -day life. So forget about God for a moment, although why you'd want to, I'm not sure. But let's do that. Forget about God for a moment. Just you practicing the laws of natural love in your day-to-day -day life. Can you imagine how enhanced that process will be? Just the interactions and the relationship. Your relationships will all become 
totally real. So you know, every little thought that you had last week about your partner, some of the thoughts were not so nice, right? And some of the thoughts were quite nice. Some of the thoughts were really nice, right? If, if you could imagine you dealing with every one of those things emotionally and all those not so quite nice thoughts started disappearing and all of the nice thoughts started getting enhanced through these emotions dropping away from you that were in error and you receiving more truth about love inside of yourself. You imagine, imagine just that state. Just that state is going to be far more powerful for your relationship. And what a lot of people don't realise with your relationship is this. It doesn't matter whether you're soulmates or not. So let's... Here's your soul, right? There's your soul. There's one of you and there's the other of you in a relationship. Now, it might not be the same soul even. So in other words, a person may not be your soulmate. But if you've got loving emotions flowing through cycling back and forward between the two of you, what is that going to do? Can you see that eventually what it does is it creates a unit of its own, which is the combination of the emotional energy of both halves. Now that unit, while it may not even be a soul union, has a, is like an entity in its own right. That unit creates other things. Now, many of you have already experienced the creation of other things of that unit. Sometimes the other things have been children, right? That you've created. Little children. Well, hopefully they don't look that bad. <laughs> anyway. Um, so they've created children through that union. So it's just these two halves of the soul being brought together through love cr creates. Children are one of those creations. But not the only creation. For many of you, you would never have created your homes without that union. Isn't that right? For many of you, you would have never bought the car you bought without that union. For many of you, you would have never experienced a lot of the emotional experiences you've had through your life without that union. You would have never enjoyed the sunset that you just watched as much as you did when you had that union. Right? And, and this is the thing, is that it creates this third entity. Even if you're not soulmates, you're creating this third entity, which is the amalgamation of the soul condition of the two halves. So if the soul condition of this half is growing in love, and the soul condition of this half is growing in love, what's happening to the soul condition of the whole? That's growing in love. And what's happening to the soul condition in terms of its law of attraction of the whole. Can you see you're also changing the law of attraction being brought into this union? So a lot of people are not aware that this is going on constantly. Now obviously when you've got a soulmate union, this gets closer and closer and closer to the point where it becomes at one with each other and that's the power of it. But even if you don't, if you're not in a soulmate union, just the act of having love even just natural love cycle through you without the resistances or blockages of emotional feelings that we've got blocking and shutting it down, just the act of doing that creates this other entity. And that other entity is very powerful and has the ability to create in its own right because, because it's creating through the amalgamation of the soul condition of the two halves. So there's always a point to growing in love, whether it just be in natural love or in divine love. All right, well, hopefully what that's done is just gotten you to en encourage you to check out things, what are going on in your relationships. And if you don't have a relationship, hopefully also what it's done is help you focus on yourself and what's going on inside of yourself emotionally as to why you don't have a relationship face up to the truth inside of ourselves. That's what we need to do. Um, Mary, you want to...? Just before you finish, um, I just wanted to mention some administrative things. Sure. Do you want to come up and do it? or uh, Can we have your microphone? And then Mary can come up and do it. We just want to mention some administrative things and I want to talk about the next talk. So. Uh, I just wanted to say that if anyone wants to be on the mailing list, uh, Pete runs a mailing list or Liz manages that for us but it's not actually our mailing list uh, if you want to most of you are on the mailing list but if anyone is new 
if they just email office at divine truth dot com if you if you've previously been on Peter's mailing list we've taken that list and it's now at office at divine truth but just for anyone new um, there's two lists running is that for the DVD list or for our mailing because it, what well, we're trying we to do we, we, we're going to talk about the next talk we're going to have is myself and Mary's vision about some of the future things that will be happening so the talk the talk is going to be very probably different than what you expect the next talk. It will be at Udlo on the Saturday, um, which is the 21st, 21st I think. is it, I think? Um, 22nd? Something like that. Um, and what we want to do is talk to you about a lot of these sort of uh, the principles involved, the spiritual and divine love principles involved in how we would like, we're developing ourselves and what we're developing in terms of connections with others. The reason why we want to deal with this is because there is the impression at times that what others say about us is, if, is what we have actually said. And I want to say to you that unless you've actually heard me say it exactly as I've, you know, exactly as it's been repeated to you, then there's a high likelihood that it's being modified by the person's emotional injuries, right? Every single one of you, when you repeat something, actually repeat it through your emotional injury. And, you know, everybody does that until you're at one with God. So it's a natural thing that occurs. But what we're, what we're trying to do now is we, we're trying to show, tell you about the things that we personally want to do. And then we also want to enable your desire to do whatever you want to do. And we want those, everyone who's around us to understand that just because one of you has a desire to do something. Now, in the future, some of you have a desire to write a book. In the future, some of you have a desire to print a magazine. And some, like at the moment, there's a fellow who has a desire to do a documentary about us. And there's all these different desires, some of which we will go along with, and some of which we will say to you, go ahead with your desire. But it doesn't mean that we agree with your desire. Do you understand? See, there's a common thought that if other people are going ahead with their, their, their desires about things, that we must then agree or support that. And we want to deal with all of that at an emotional level, why that actually occurs. So our next talk is going to be about that. We haven't decided what to head it yet, have we? But that's the general subject. And we'll talk about the law of desire, and we'll talk about the law of free will, and how we want to see things occur for ourselves and then make suggestions to you about how you might want to run things for yourself. What we want to do is enable your desires as much as we possibly can, and particularly if those desires are harmonious with love. But we, and we don't want to stop you if your desires aren't harmonious with love. Because remember, we talked about that in this sessions of God's laws. If I'm trying to stop you from acting upon your desire, even if it's disharmonious with love, I am out of harmony with love. But one thing we do want to address is this problem that we had in the first century which is starting to rear its head now. And that is this problem where other people think I'm doing the wrong thing, not what they would do. So some people feel that I should be writing books. Some people feel that I should be, you know, um, producing the DVDs myself. Some people feel that um, what's other things that they feel that we've had recently? <laughs> that we should be in places and do things a certain way. Yeah, and that, that we should interact with people a certain way and so forth. And all of that comes from their desire for us to do what they think we should do. And we want to work our way through this problem because in the first century my death actually resulted from this problem. Right? Many of you don't realise that what you say about us, even when it's in error, has an effect on us personally. Do you follow me? So it's like if I went away and I said, like Mary said such and such, and if I took what Mary said out of context, then all of you may believe Mary actually said it. Like, for example, I have said in the past that the divine love path is simple. I've said that quite a lot, eh? So if you went off now and only quoted that bit, the divine love path is simple, 
And then some people who had never heard the Divine Love Path heard the three basic simple things about the Divine Love Path and then they'd say, well, if it's that simple, why isn't AJ at one we've got then? It mustn't be working. But what also did I say when I said the Divine Love Path is simple? <laughs> it's not easy. You see how you could leave the bit, that bit off, couldn't you? And you could just say a half of it and you would be saying, you would be saying what I said but it's not the full amount of what I said. But you can you see how it, well, it can affect people quite a lot. Just the second part of the sentence. And what happened in the first century, if I could illustrate, Judas and a number of other um, so-called what you know as apostles, but they were just friends of ours, a number of them thought that I should be the king of the Jews. They thought I was charismatic at the time and they thought I could be a good leader and they thought that I was doing things that healing and therefore I had a lot of people following me and things like that. A lot of people listened to me, a lot of people in power listened to me at different times as well. And so they thought that I should be the person who is the king of the Jews, overthrows the Romans and so forth. But every time they talked to me about it, I said no. Now, if you believe you know better than I do about how I should live my life, <laughs> you will then go down the track of trying to force me into living my life the way you believe I should. You see, I don't want to force you into living your life the way I believe you should. All I'm doing is just giving you a group, a bit of information which you can take or leave at your leisure. I don't, want to shape, I don't want to force you to do any of it. But in the first century what happened is this group of disciples started feeling that I didn't really know what I was doing. And so what they then started doing was setting up things around me that they didn't tell me about or misrep misrepresented me in a way that would get bites from people that they knew that I would then have to deal with. And slowly that problem escalated until eventually what happened, even in our relationship, what happened, many of the disciples eventually left us as a result because of them feeling I should do with Mary things that, or treat Mary in a certain way that they thought she should be treated. But going further down the line of the Judas thing, what happened was Judas then decided that I needed to have a conflict with the Sanhedrin that I needed to have a conflict with the Romans in order to set myself up as king. None of which I wanted, but it is what they wanted for me. So they had the arrogance of trying to control my life for me. Now, once they set up that, they then started setting up meetings behind the scenes without me being aware of what was going on. And they started setting up events saying that yeah I'd probably go to that event and so forth and sometimes I did and sometimes I didn't but if I did it was assumed and these people managed me and after a while Judas thought he could manage me you follow me and as a direct result of his management of me I died and he wasn't he wasn't trying to harm me he thought he was doing a good thing and sometimes many of you may feel that you're doing a good thing. In the future you maybe feel like you're doing a good thing for us. But if there is no personal interaction with us, then my suggestion is, there, and we're, one of the things we want to cover next, next time we get together, is what is a good thing? Do you know what I mean? But eventually what happened is Mary had lots of terrible sadness to deal with as a result of my passing just because a group of people believed they were doing what was best for me. And I died as a result of that. Judas suicided because of it. And there were a lot of other things that occurred. So what we want to do is talk to you about the emotions involved in all of these actions. Because some of you are beginning to have the same kind of emotions inside of yourselves. And we want to help address those emotions with you now rather than later and when things get out of hand. In the future, many of you are going to be faced with many powerful decisions. Those powerful decisions will be influencing literally millions of people. 
because you're the first persons involved in hearing the truth, you are going to be influencing many millions of people. If you're going to do it out of disharmony with love, you are going to create many disharmony, disha disharmonious actions which will create a lot of pain for people around you. And this is for us to have this discussion, we feel, at this time. Does that make sense? So, so that's what we'll be doing our next time together. What would you want to say? I just wanted to add, it's not really about uh, altering anyone's free will or desire, no. but just about us being transparent about where we're coming from and what our vision is and the way we want to have our life. Kerry, would you like Katrina. to? Katrina, sorry. Just on the um, subject of quoting you accurately, um, I, would you recommend, are you suggesting that, um, is it better to say to somebody like, I've just been south for example, my friends are like, well what are you up to? Well, <laughs> we've taken a complete, you know, er, turn spiritually and we've met AJ Miller and Mary and watched a gazillion DVDs and, you know, following a different path. Um, here, read the DVD, let it speak for itself. I'm not yep. saying another word. Zip. Is yep. that the thing to do? Well, I don't want to control what you do. That's part of this point. That we, this is the reason why we want to have this discussion. The truth is I don't want to control anything you do, either positive or negative. But what I would like you to bear in mind is that to ask yourself, if, you're being if you are misquoting, what's the emotional reason inside of yourself for doing it? Some of you do have an emotional reason of wanting things to happen a different way than they're currently happening, right? And you do need to address those emotions and we want to talk about that. I don't want to control how you talk about the truth. And I don't want to, I just want you to be mindful of the results of what you talk about. One of the emotions Mary was crying about this morning, and by the way, this is not a result of Mary's emotions this morning. This is something that I've thought about for some time. But Mary's, one of Mary's emotions this morning was crying about how much people make decisions that affect our life without them knowing. And then we get lots of anger from somebody or lots of resentment coming. Now that is our law of attraction. So we do need to work our way through those emotions which Mary was doing this morning. And I feel personally that as we do, you know, all of these problems will slowly dissipate. But even when we're at one with God, and as I was in the first century, many people around me thought they knew better than what I was teaching them to do for my own life. So I'm not saying it's fine for you to know better about your life. In other words, if you feel things should be presented in a certain way, go for it. You do that for your own life. Don't listen to what I'm saying. You need to decide what you want for your life. What I'm saying is, don't involve us in our life in that action in a negative way, if you can help it. Now, what I mean by that is like, um, what's probably a good example to give? Well, in the first century... <laughs> sorry? I was going to say something. You want to say something? Go on. Um, in the first century, Judas did his actions because he believed he knew how I should be acting in my life. Does that make sense to you? Like he believed that <clears throat> he believed that I should be the king of the Jews, even though I was saying no, I am never going to be. Right? He believed I should be. So he believed he knew better. Not for his own life. I'm quite happy for him to know better about his own life because he does know better about his own life than I do. But what I'm saying is he thought he knew better about what I should do with my life. And then he tried to make it happen. And in the process of trying to make it happen, created a lot of very negative events of which, with me being in truth, I would not be able to deal with any differently than I did. <coughs> So does that sort of illustrate what we're talking about? And, and my feeling is that this, um, what AJ is teaching is God's truth and it belongs to all of us. And I feel if you feel passionate about it, why wouldn't you speak with a anyone you felt drawn to do that with? I think the issue is more about um, people having the emotion about wanting to control our direction 
and to control the way we utilise our free will. So that's sort of where... Um, mm. okay. and, and there's a lot of principles of free will involved in this. I don't want you to do what I'm saying you should do. In fact, I'm not even saying you should do anything. I'm just saying if you want a connection with God, this is what you are going to have to do at some point. But only if you want a connection with God. You may decide you don't want that connection with God. And, so, and you may decide that actually, you know, AJ, I feel I can get a connection with God in a different way. And that's okay with me. That's your life. And you're allowed to choose to do what you want with your life. But whenever you choose to force me to do something what I want to do with my life into being what you want, now we're talking about a different matter altogether. And so there's this, there's this tendency at times for people to want to utilise us in order to assist them in their life. Right? And some of it's driven emotionally. Some of it's like, oh, if I talk to AJ and Mary, they'll tell me what emotions got going on for myself instead of me wanting to work out for myself what emotion I've got going on inside of myself. Some of it is that you want us to do things for you that you feel might benefit your life, which is actually quite a selfish act as well. And so what we're suggesting is we're going to have this session the next time we get together where we'll talk very specifically about the groups of emotions that were present in the first century disciples um, that, that were, you know, which I don't feel are disciples, I feel they were my friends, but unfortunately many of them did not treat me like a friend. Many of them finished up making decisions for my life without me knowing and then forcing me to respond in a certain way because they didn't realise they were forcing me. Does that make sense? They thought I would go down a certain path and they didn't understand the truth and I went down a totally different path than what they thought I would take. You see, Judas thought that I'd have big demonstration in front of the Sanhedrin, that I'd show them some healing and I'd heal a few of them and you know, do some powerful things about their lives, tell them about their lives and do some mediumistic things that I could do and, and all of those kind of things and, and then prove to them that I was the Messiah and all of a sudden they'd want me to be their leader. That's what he thought. He thought that all the abilities I had at the time, I would just be able to use them all, I would want to use them all to get into that place. He didn't understand I didn't want that. But he thought he could force me into that. And in his actions and everything he did, he forced me down this road that he thought he was creating one thing, but because I was acting in harmony with the truth and love, I could only do another. And he didn't understand that until he realised what he'd done and he saw me being hung and realised what he'd done which is the reason why he's suicided. And what I'm trying to illustrate here with this discussion is that we need to all enable our own free will. So I'm perfectly happy for you to do anything you want with the divine truth you are receiving. Absolutely every bit of information that we're giving out, every video, every... And by the way, I'm not talking about the DVDs Peter produces here. We are taking responsibility, myself and Mary, for the, for the recording of this information and the, and the actual videoing of this information now. We will give that to anybody who wants it free of charge, as long as they have some technical abilities to do it without us spending much time doing it. We're perfectly happy to do that to anyone. We will give all of this information for free. Right? So what Peter's doing with the DV is a totally separate thing. That's his baby. Does that make sense? That's his desire, where his desire is taking him. Right? And many of you assume that I agree with his desire, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but it's his desire. And I'm not going to control his desire. The only thing I want him to do is to, to work through his desire with God and work out what's harmonious with love and what isn't. Does that make sense? And that's all I, that's all I want to do, is to help him do that as I want to help all of you do the same thing. So we're going to just give, keep giving this information to the world for free. That's what we came here to do. But we didn't come here to support lots of different things that you might want to do to make money out of and all those kind of things. That's not why we're here. 
We're here purposefully just to give the truth to the world for free. That's why we're here. So, so in amongst that, many of you will feel we're doing the wrong thing. Right? And what we're asking you to do is if you feel that, to go into that emotionally and allow yourself to feel about that, rather than saying or doing things or manipulating things behind the scenes that force us to act a way that you won't expect until you're at the same condition, in the same emotional or spiritual condition. You will not expect us to act a certain way if we're harmonious with love or truth or free will or those other laws. And so what I'm suggesting is allow yourself firstly to work through the emotional reasons why you have desires to do things that incorporate us. Now, for many of you, you're learning the truth and that's a wonderful thing. Feel free to tell the truth to the world because that's a wonderful thing too, that you can do that. You don't need our permission any time to do anything. You can grab any of the, any of the material from the net that we've got. None, all of it's free. You don't need to ask my permission. You don't need to ask my permission to organise a group that you want to teach. You don't need to ask my permission or try to get my help for anything at all. Nothing at all do you need my help for. All you need is your desire for God and away you'll go. That's all you need. Nothing else. You don't need me at all aside from me just telling you the truth that we have already learned. That's all. When you follow your desire and passion and you do it harmonious with love, it's going to create some remarkable things in your life. And, you know, some of you are going to be publishing things. Some of you are going to be printing things. Some of you are going to be writing books. Some of you are going to be doing movies. Some of you are going to be building ecosystems. Some of you are going to be building retreats. Some of you are going to be doing all sorts of things. But none of it will need me or Mary to do. Does that make sense? And that will be driven by your passion and your desire and your connection with God and your love for your neighbour. It won't be driven by needing my permission to do anything. So lately you notice that some of you have come and asked permission, or can we do this? And I'm saying, what? Why? What? <laughs> why do you need my permission to do anything? You do not need my permission to do anything. I am not God and I don't even want to tell you what you should do. All I want to do is tell you the truth of how to connect to God and connect to each other. Now, you don't even have to accept that. Does that make sense? And what we want to do the next talk is talk a lot more detail about that and how that it will play out in your own lives. And we'll talk about some of the future directions that you might take because of that. But understand, you do not need to involve us in your desires. In fact, if you're involving us in our, your desires without our will being involved, <laughs> you're actually now breaking a law. Right? So let yourself just follow your desires freely. And all of the, we've given all these things for free because you can then run with them and do whatever you want with them. You can even abuse me with them if that's what you want. You can get every single thing I've said in every single DVD and misquote it out of context and plaster it all over the net if that's what you want. And I'll be okay with that. I don't want to control any of that. Does that make sense to everyone? All I want to do is just keep on giving out the truth. Eventually, it's all going to take off, guys. And before you know it, this world's going to change because of the truth. And that's what's going to happen for sure. So please understand that myself and Mary love you very much and what all we're trying to do is just, you know, we want to have a, a little life of our own in this little process that we're going through and, uh, and we want that life to be also a free life just like we want your life to be a free life. So that's really important for you to understand. And I just think you're all so beautiful and watching you all change and grow is just wonderful. And the reason, part of the motivation for us wanting to have this talk is because we don't feel an expectation or an obligation from you. And, and we don't 
really want that to have an expectation or obligation from you guys towards us. Uh, it would be great if we could all just grow together, you know? Yeah. Okay. Thanks, guys. Um, I th so I think that's about it. Um, hopefully you've all enjoyed yourself this weekend. Um, you're not feeling too tired with two things too close together. I want to check on that occasionally. <laughs> um, so the next group, three weeks, three weekends away from today um, is the next group at Udlo. And then the one after that, uh, we're not sure of or certain of at this point because the booking hasn't been confirmed. So what we'll be doing is emailing out to you the other things. Um, so hopefully over the next few weeks you'll hear, get, hear from us again about what's happening after then. So cheers for now.